white kohoita. Hello, everyone. Emily Hope in Squawks. Wa'ach the Elkstwin, the Kamloops Art Gallery. My name is Emily Hope. I'm the Education and Public Programs Director here at the Kamloops Art Gallery. Latkla Sitchikits. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I expect that many of you have been and continue to be impacted by the ongoing emergencies in communities across the province amid devastating flooding and landslides. Our thoughts are with you and with everyone who is impacted by this climate disaster. Before we begin our program, I'd like to take a moment to situate ourselves. The concept of here is somewhat abstract in these virtual gatherings, but for myself and those of you joining us from the regions surrounding the gallery and the museum, here is to come up some I introduced myself in Sukhutmchin because that is the language of this land. What we refer to as Kamloops and beyond, spanning over 180,000 square kilometers across the interior plateau of what we call British Columbia, is Sukhutm Utluch, the territory of the Sukhutm people. It is an immense privilege to be a guest on these lands, and I am so grateful to my teachers, Jessica Arnous and Sunny Prairie Chicken, for continuing to make space for me in their classrooms, their generosity, guidance, and patience. I'm joined today by Kamloops Museum and Archives educator, Morella Nahonsigaye, curators Makiko Hara and Craig Wilms, artists Diane Ahiadi and Jenna Sasaki, as well as the folks from Collective Broadcast who are managing all of the tech in the background. Our program will be about an hour and a half in duration, including some time at the end for questions and conversation. You can submit your questions for our panelists through the Q&A box, and you are also encouraged to chat amongst yourselves with, and with us through the chat window. I'm going to begin by reading some very brief biographies to introduce you to each of our panelists, and then I'll hand it over to Morella, who will facilitate tonight's conversation. Makiko Hara is an independent curator, lecturer, researcher, writer, and art incubator. Born in Tokyo, Japan and based in Vancouver, her principal focus has been creating platforms for dialogue and exchange between artists in Canada, Asia, and beyond. Co-founder of Tokyo Art Speak, Hara was chief curator at Center A in Vancouver from 2007 to 2013 and has since worked independently on numerous solo and group exhibition projects in Canada and Japan. Craig Wilms is the assistant curator at the Kamloops Art Gallery, where he curates the Cube as a project space focusing on artists from the region. Born in Kamloops, BC, Wilms holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and received a BC Arts Council grant to support the operation of his social art practice, the Office of Surrealist Investigations. Diana Ahiadi's formative years were spent moving between multiple educational, political, and cultural systems. Born in Jakarta, Indonesia, to a West Javanese father and English-Canadian mother, Ahiadi received a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Cooper Union in New York and a Master of Fine Arts from Concordia University in Montreal. She is now based in Vancouver, BC, where she is professor in the Audain Faculty of Art at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Born and raised in British Columbia, Canada, Jenna Sasaki is a Bachelor of Fine Arts graduate from Thomas Rivers University and a recipient of the Helen Pitt Award. Sasaki has exhibited her work locally and internationally in venues located in Japan, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands. She currently lives and works in Vancouver, Vancouver BC. Morella K. Nahonsigaye is a communication and media studies doctoral student at Carleton University. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Media, Communication, and Film, as well as a Master of Arts in Communication and Social Justice from the University of Windsor. Her research interests broadly include cultural technique and memory, media theory and epistemology, futurity and Afro-Black studies, archives and curation. She is currently working with the Kamloops Museum and Archives as their museum educator. I'll now hand it over to Morella. Hi. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction um, and for situating us um, and acknowledging the land of the traditional peoples, uh, the Sukhum peoples. I really appreciate that. And um, thank you for having me here during this panel discussion. I'm really honored to facilitate this discussion today. Um, and 
uh, we'll start with an introduction of uh, both exhibitions. Um, I'd like to start with an introduction of the Who Stories exhibition at uh, the Kamloops Art uh, Gallery. Um, it was curated by uh, Makiko. So I would like to open the floor to the introduction of that uh, exhibition. Hi everyone, um, I'm Maki Kohara, I'm uh, based in Vancouver, and thank you Emily and uh, Mirelas for organizing these panels. And thank you uh, Diane, Jana, and Craig for sharing your time with me. It's, I found it's very important to bring the artist voice and shares at such a condition of ongoing pandemic. I'm so happy to have a dialogue with you all and thank you for all to participating for this panel today. Um, I think it uh, was asked to briefly giving um, kind of um, ideas about the exhibition at first. Is that right? Okay. Um, so first and most, I thank to Charo Nebel, Chief Curator of Kamloops at Gallery, who invited me in 2019. 19 to curate an exhibition. Over the two years due to the COVID-19 pandemic unexpectedly, the exhibition's idea has been revised many, many times and we realize it is very challenging to work in remote, but with her tremendous support and encouragement, we could open the exhibition whose story. And this was also not possible without the uh, huge work and help by the amazing team of Kamloops at Gary. Thank you for all great staff, for all your help and making this happen and taking care of the exhibitions. And the last and most, I'm so grateful for the all artists who participate in my show and sharing your great uh, works of art. At this image, uh, the time is limited. I won't go into the detail, but um, for the most of uh, people that attending these panels may not be able to visit the gallery. So um, I just want to share that, uh, ask to share that uh, the slide of the installation while I'm explaining ideas of the exhibition in brief. So um, we all sharing a very challenging time of the pandemic over the year right now, of course, it affects our lives so dramatically. And we are at the very crucial historical moment. Some said it's a paradigm shift, but we don't know yet how does it be told in the futures of our experience. In such a difficult time, I feel that it is important to share experiences our own by telling our own stories expressing feeling and strong and our shared resilience and offer us a hope as a tool of healing. And through the works of six artists, Diane Akiadi and Tomoyo Ihaya, Naoko Fukumaru, Lord Nadito, Mark Salvatos, and Ujino, live and come from different places. Whose story provides an opportunity to reflect on experience and narratives of the others through the power of sharing wisdom, belief of living, joy, discoveries of everyday life. All story told from a very personal perspective. In whose story, the work of each artist raises the following questions, such as. How the larger narrative of historicized group are constructed and told? What experiences are excluded? Whose voices are silenced and marginalized? How can those voices be heard? How we add our voice and create an alternative and inclusive more truthful history that restore individual human rights and dignity and transform our own future. I believe that arts tell a story that no one else can tell. 
I think there's a lot of untold story in every culture. Those are not in the history books or Hollywood movies. There are so many untold story that fall between those historicized larger narratives because it is so small and personal. But still, there's a countless anonymous stories that exist. Art can scope up those stories that nobody talks about. Art, unlike the Hollywood movie, offer more questions than the answers. It's not about what is right or wrong. Instead, art makes us think where we situate ourselves in others' stories. That's what I'm interested in, those stories offered by the artists in their uh, distinguished visual language. It gives us opportunity to think about complex and multifaceted issues reflectively. In the case of art, there's no such a thing as a clear story to tell. There's no need to even to have a story flow or a clear message. It doesn't have to be a truth. Maybe it's, true, it's a truth, maybe it's a myth or fiction. So I think that we live in a very complex time. The COVID-19 global pandemic has revealed so many hidden or forgotten issues, but now we are all aware some degree that these complex issues are interconnected globally. The most of our present issues are deeply rooted in our own past, our colonial past. But I don't think it is possible to make a single judgment about the whole things from one place. I think it's human nature to find some kind of hope and resilience. And no matter how tough the situation is, no matter how harsh the situation is, each and every one of us has something to think about and find hope in it. So by encountering and learning of others' story through art, we can find a different perspective to see those issues critically, but humanly and more respect, uh, reflectively. That's what, and that's how I believe in the power of art. And that's why I made the exhibition title Food Stories by putting a question mark at the end with my hope that the exhibition open a new place where I reflect our thought with others. And uh, I'm gonna pass to the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Makiko. Um, I'm looking forward to diving into a lot of that. That's so, so exciting and very insightful. Um, and I would now like to invite Craig to also share the, uh, the curatorial process and the general idea behind um, the Collective Memories Japanese Canadian Reflections exhibition that's featured here at the Kamloops Museum and Archives, um, as well as uh, Identity and Justice, which is featured at the Cube at the uh, Kamloops Art Gallery. Uh, thank you very much, Mirella. Um, I just, uh, <clears throat> wanted to start off with saying my regular day job, of course, is the Count's Art Gallery. And then to be putting this show together at the KMA has been a really great experience. And to kind of come in as a guest curator, um, initially uh, asked by uh, Matt McIntosh at the KMA to kind of jump in has been a great experience. Um, I did want to start just by looking, uh, just saying that I, th I was really brought in at the beginning of the exhibition to come and work with the Camus Japanese Canadian Association and to really figure out what kind of exhibition we were going to put together. So it was really about trying to find, I would say, the Japanese Canadian community's voice, uh, particularly 
in Kamloops and kind of looking at it as being part of the KMA and this kind of museological approach, I guess, and, and history, yet kind of coming from my regular work with contemporary art, trying to kind of bring these things together. Uh, Matt was quite uh, encouraging of that, I guess, since he's come to the KMA, I think we've seen a lot more of that kind of mix rather than the kind of authoritative history show. It was bringing other elements in and more people and, and artists at times. So uh, that's kind of, he left it quite wide open, but that's, I guess, where I was coming from, trying to bring these things together a little bit. Uh, speaking with the KJCA, uh, it was really also trying to figure out what they wanted to say and what their voice was. So I appreciate what Makiko was saying about uh, what art has to offer and this perspective or this, this uh, access point and that it brings up questions. So trying to bring some of that while covering a lot of like local history and internment and the broader history of the Japanese Canadian experience. So it took uh, actually quite a while to get to kind of get to that and to really figure out how we were going to express that. And then knowing that the Japanese Canadian community was larger than just the KJCA that I was working with. So it was really trying to get out into that community and really see what that voice was. Um, part of, I also had spoken to the Nikkei Center in Burnaby and their curator, um, Sherry, uh, sorry, Kajiwara. And she had also come from a contemporary art background. So perhaps the best advice I got was uh, go with what you know. So my thought, I'm not sure exactly at what point I contacted Jana Sasaki, but it was that to bring some artists in and to work with our community. And I think the initial questions to Jana were about what she was working on or what she was doing. And she'd had these works that she was doing about Japantown and Powell Street and working with community and bringing out these stories. So that really pushed a lot of what happened in our exhibition at the KMA. So really, instead of historical survey, get into people's experiences, which uh, often was hard to draw out of people, but to try and get that perspective. And, and I think, in, again, in that reference, what Makiko was saying to, um, bring up these questions and not everything is kind of big truth history. It's just a matter of perspectives from different people. And that was a big thing with looking at the local history is everybody had, uh, the Japanese Canadian community had little bits and pieces. And sometimes they would conflict with each other or, or contradictory, or sometimes they would you'd talk to enough people and they would clear a lot of that up. So much of the material in Collective Memories is uh, people's, as the title says, it's their collective, it's their reflections. So it was trying to get, uh, sorry, I was looking at some of the images here, trying to really get a sense of that community and how they saw it, and then still bring in kind of the bigger uh, issues of the community, the bigger pieces of identity, which then also has been covered so extensively through museum shows, through so much other art. Um, we found a good way to, to address a lot of that was through a lot of filmmaking that had been made. And Jeff Chiba Stearns, who grew up in Kelowna, was a contact that I had, who's a Jap half Japanese Canadian filmmaker, um, like myself. I'm not a filmmaker, but half Japanese. And uh, 
he knew the network of Japanese Canadian filmmakers that were making work, dealing with identity, dealing with history, dealing with all these things. So that kind of uh, tied, kind of tied everything together in addition to having uh, a short documentary that uh, the KJCA had put together to, to, to look at things like redress and internment and those things. So it was still getting uh, local people's perspective on that, even though a lot of those stories, a lot of that history uh, was incredibly difficult to draw out of people and to uh, have people really want to share. I think that was the big uh, difference in say my day job and my job at the KMA is uh, artists kind of will, know they're coming to share these things and express these things and put these things out there and have this voice. And for community members and, and a Japanese Canadian uh, organization to do that isn't as comfortable or isn't as, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it simple, but they're not used to doing that. So that was a big part of kind of bringing that exhibition together. Um, and then through various factors and, and timing with pandemic and other things, to have these shows line up with whose stories at the Counts Art Gallery and some other, uh, and to have another, uh, uh, well, let's just say other complications. It actually allowed me to have a show in the Cube, the project space at the Counts Art Gallery uh, with Jana Sasaki because of the work she had been doing in Powell Street, Japantown that tied into it things that were happening in Kamloops at the time and really tied the work together, community-minded. Uh, in addition to her being from Merritt and the Kamloops Art Gallery already having works of hers in our collection um, that looked at internment, that looked at uh, Jap Hapa, Japanese, Hap -Jap uh, Jap part Asian identity, and to kind of tie this show into, into the cube and have all this go at once really, uh, I think made everything really kind of come together nicely, which, which had been a long, had been a goal of both institutions, the Kamloops Museum and Archives and the Kamloops Art Gallery to kind of uh, get on the same page at the same time and, and have these as exhibitions uh, relate to each other and talk to each other. I'll, I'll pass that along to the next uh, questions here. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, thank you both Craig and Makiko for giving us um, sort of a, an introduction and walk through um, through some of the exhibitions. Um, I, I hope, you know, in some way or another that everyone that is participating, um, that is watching, uh, this panel discussion gets a chance to uh, engage with both exhibitions, um, you know, in any way possible. And uh, for those of you that are out of town, um, hopefully this um, this introduction has uh, offered you um, some kind of insight on uh, what we're discussing today, um, sort of give you a bit of context, sort of visually. Um, and uh, before I invite everyone to um, kind of start participating in sort of some general questions I'd like to ask um, and some discussions I'd like to uh, engage in, um, I want to offer a little bit of perspective of where I'm coming from um, amidst this conversation between both of these exhibitions. Um, as uh, Emily said in the introduction, I, uh, I'm the museum educator here at the Kansas Museum and Archives, uh, newly appointed in this position. I've been here for about four months, so a relatively short time. Um, and coming into this position too, um, I entered uh, sort of in the middle of the Collective Memories exhibition, um, kind of having been officially 
put together and, and ready to uh, show um, to the public and be open to the public. And um, something that Craig said, uh, the piece of advice that he was given into you know, how to approach doing that exhibition, uh, this idea of go with what you know, um, I think is wonderful advice and was the best way I felt that I could uh, approach my position um, as a museum educator um, and to share some of the ideas, the general ideas and the general themes of the Collective Memories Exhibition to the public. Um, and so far I've been able to do that in the form of tours. Um, and I've been very clear with the public that um, these are not my stories. Um, they're not stories that I am intimately familiar with in that way. I, I am Burundian, I'm Burundian Canadian. Um, but what I do have in common, um, as Makiko mentioned in her introduction, um, this sort of experience of the what colonization has done, um, that is something that is very intimately uh, personal for me. Um, and so the perspective that I wanted to share with the public was to discuss the importance of cultural memory um, when it comes to discussing the experience um, of history as opposed to kind of the traditional historiographic methods of, of talking about the experiences of in this, in this particular situation for the Collective Memories Exhibition, um, the Japanese Canadian experience of, of what it meant to be of that identity. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to go into this conversation uh, about identity um, kind of broadly and to talk about it from the perspective of history and the perspective of exhibition. Um, and what both of those uh, themes of history and exhibition do to the conversation or the question and the topic of identity. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite everyone um, to start. Um, and I'd like to share just uh, or prompt this discussion with a very general question, um, which is in uh, everyone's respective practice. So for Makiko and Craig as curators, um, and Diane and Jenna as artists, um, would you be able to share a little bit on um, how you engage with the question of identity? Uh, and the exploration of it. Um, so whether that is talking about how you encountered the importance of discussing identity, uh, what does identity mean to you in your respective practices? Um, perhaps we can start, Craig, your camera is on, perhaps we can start with you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, a lot of these questions like, I like this, uh, I still like this idea that art and all these things bring up more questions. Um, the, my experience with working with community members, uh, especially looking at the history in Canada was that a lot of it, uh, people didn't wanna talk about, particularly the generation that was in, interned, for example, or, I had all this information that was like, in Kamloops, there were eight Japanese families, but that was the end of the information. There were no names or there'd be two family names or something like that. So talking to the next generation, which would be my parents, didn't hear a lot about this until redress time, I suppose, the fight for redress. So that's when suddenly all these stories came out and they were, uh, there's a lot of surprise uh, amongst people. So to kind of learn that and to learn maybe why there, um, I think that there had been a quite an urging, it seems in the community to be Canadian and to embrace the place you're, you're in and, and uh, kind of leave that behind and then not talk about a lot of stuff. Like that experience comes up or that conversation came up quite a bit. And then if you look at something like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Brian Hayashi's experience on the hot farms in the KMA show, he talks about growing up between generations, a little bit of his grandparents, a little bit of his parents and getting 
kind of different perspectives. There was, a, there was kind of a Japanese uh, cultural aspect, but there's a Canadian aspect and there's a, a, enough curiosity. I think a lot of that comes up later, um, but just the fact that finally it gets shared, I think was the big thing to kind of keep that going. I, I'm still not sure what my identity means or what it matters. Uh, excuse me. And I guess that was part of, mostly the purpose of the exhibition is to find that out a little bit and find out what that experience means and how it follows through and uh, who might be part of the community or not, and whether they embrace that or not. And with working with a cultural organization, it's uh, why are we doing these things sometimes? And it's important and it's part of, uh, I don't feel like that identity is that much part of my, my art practice, but it's in there somewhere. But it's it's it fits in there somehow, and it's part of who you are. And that looking back, like I've been to the homeland, I've been to Japan, been to the family home, so it's uh, yeah. To know that history is there, I suppose, is a big thing, and to know it certainly opened my eyes to a lot of my community growing up. I would say. I'm gonna let someone else talk for a bit. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's certainly a big question. Um, and I I'd like to just alleviate the pressure that there needs to be like this profound exacting like right question. Identity is a very big topic, and I, I'm keeping it broad just because we could go into you know the discussion of what I mean by ident what do we mean by identity per definition, the academic definition of identity, identity politics and such. Um, but what I'm looking for is is a, a, a personal kind of engagement that you've had in your respective practices. So if it if the answer isn't fully there, it's in process. It's it's obviously not firm, set in stone. I mean, despite the fact that this interview is being recorded, please know that it's not. There's no expectation that this is going to be the only answer going on uh, forward. But um, it's just to to get your your thoughts. Um, just because I'm I'm so interested, I, I definitely have my own questions of of my identity. Very similarly, I've never been back home to Burundi before, um, and you know, there's there is all of that that comes into my own practice as a researcher and in this situation as an educator, and it's certainly complicated. So I fully expect the answers to reflect that as well. Um, so Makiko, uh, I wonder if if it's okay, we can um, bring the question to you um, from your curatorial, curatorial practice and process for whose stories. Um, you touched a lot on you know, what identity and the importance of stories are in this exhibition and, and the role that art plays in that area. And uh, I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit further um, with specifically with the question of identity in mind. Um, and how that plays a part in the curatorial practice for uh, whose stories. Mm -hmm. Yep, well, uh, it's a huge question and it's very hard to answer, but um, uh, this, uh, the, when I'm working on these ideas of whose story, that's the, of course the pandemic really shift and make me think deeper and then really different way to think about the identity. Like for example, like I'm a landed immigrant. I moved from Tokyo, but my family, uh, I mean, only very small family, like my mother and my sis sister and then my nephew, it's in Tokyo. And then I think in the last five years, I was back in force because my mother's got dementia and in the and the nursing home. So I, I my, myself, like I, how I can identify and where I belong. And it's part of my mind always been part of Japan, but 
at the same time, I belong to this place. And then since that's the mobilities of like, you know, going back to the place that I could use to go cannot happen during the pandemic. I start a little bit kind of confused myself about where I belong and, you know, that. So that's the, I'm sure that many immigrants in Canada and in this multicultural society, that's many people feeling that the kind of divided culture identity. And so that, so it's, I'm start thinking of that it's not I'm like, so that's, it's not about that the kind of authentic kind of Japanese or Canadian, that kind of things. There's in, always in between situations and it's very fluid. And, but also I, um, when I prepare this show that I've been talking with an artist, many of them are in between different cultures. And I, realized that I start remember of when I move here and start walking in a center A, which the institution's primary interest and focus and mandate was about contemporary Asian art to introduce. But uh, in the context of in Vancouver and specifically by the location in downtown East Side, which really uh, a transformative experience for me, myself, that's how situate myself in the context of downtown east side to talking about or bringing artist voice and walks to, um, to present of their walks within the situations of, and I mean, I'm, I'm just assumed that everybody knows about downtown east side. And then I think the Yana is walking. So maybe I can, you know, kind of uh, maybe question to you too. But um, the, it was a time that it was 2007. So that's about the time that's the uh, reconciliation and in, truth and reconciliation started and then and then also around the times of the Olympics and so many gentrification. And we, as an institution, play very crucial rules at the locations and how, you know, that's the kind of contemporary art convey to, and, and from a more like Asian and like Asian Canadian and how myself to locate in that kind of, context was always in question and then it's kind of learning process for me and that so every time and then it's at the process of becoming a Canadian in a way I learned so many um, history and stuff like about culture context of Canada and Vancouver through the artist works and an academic and art community to be informed about that this kind of complex identity issues. And so, yes, like, um, so the food story is in the similar way that I um, wanted to bring that it's each story, it's very specific time and space, but also has kind of shared and then kind of created a new uh, understanding of who we are and how we share those kind of more universal questions. And uh, that's maybe built up our kind of collective identity in a way. Thank you. No, that's brilliant. Um, both you and Craig touch on something that I'm hoping we can go further into detail about just the, the general fluidity of what identity is um, and what it's like to engage with that 
um, particularly when it comes to having to work within a structure or you're speaking back to a particular structure like history. Um, but before we get there, I, I'd like to pass on the similar question uh, over to uh, Deanne. Um, so uh, to kind of contextualize uh, a bit more specifically, so in your respective practice as an artist, um, could you talk a little bit about the, the role of identity um, in your practice, whether it's a question, whether um, there was a time where the importance of exploring it in your uh, artistic practice, um, when that became urgent, if it was ever urgent, um, just how, how does identity uh, play or what role does it play in, in your work? Um, especially in particularly speaking to uh, your, your art piece at the uh, Who Stories exhibition. Thanks, Mirella. Um, and um, I guess what I'll start with is kind of similar to what Craig and Matiko have been saying you know, um, kind of the way that one's personal history starts to inform how one navigates the world and how one thinks about the world. And so, um, as Emily mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm biracial. I was born in Indonesia and I grew up moving around quite a bit. Um, I have uh, one half of my family is Muslim. The other half is Anglican. Um, part of my family is Indonesia, part of it is in Canada. And then I had elementary school in a few different types of school systems. And so what that really led me to always be interested in is that um, as I was kind of navigating so many different social situations and cultural situations, really noticing how what not just how I was perceived, but how one understood what was normal or one, how one understood what was kind of the ex expected in terms of how, how one moved through the world really changed from place to place. And so a lot of my work has always been um, kind of trying to understand how it is that we learn things and how it is that we learn to, to be a certain way. Um, and so probably my earliest works that um, looked at identity were kind of very specifically thinking through gender and thinking through queerness and, um, uh, heteronormativity. Um, and because I'm trained as a printmaker, um, I've always been interested in looking at illustrations and illustrated books. And that was always the kind of the place that I would start with. I'd see like what, what, what pictures already exist and how do pictures start to tell us how it is that we're supposed to be in the world. And of course, through that, I became really interested in children's uh, images and children's books and children's uh, media and toys, because, you know, thinking through that formative period that we learn kind of what you know, a proper girl is supposed to be, whatever that means. Um, as I was making this work, um, I, you know, I went to college in the United States and grad school in Canada, uh, while my family was in Indonesia. And at the time that I was living in Indonesia um, was during the Suharto era, era, which was a very authoritarian, militaristic um, government. And uh, when the Suharto era um, uh, finally ended in 1998, um, through a moment of very uh, intense violence, um, uh, what became really evident um, after he fell was that the history that I had learned was mostly fiction, you know, and so, and, you know, it was really quite literally made up to support the government that existed. And so that also, that then kind of made me much more um, interested in also thinking through not just how did I learn to be a girl or how do we learn to be kind of, you know, inhabit the world and the bodies that we inherited and how do we change that or rebel against that, but also, um, you know, thinking through this history that I was in, knew a little bit about, didn't know so much about. I think Craig had said something about that as well in terms of his, his uh, uh, speaking to um, the communities. And then I started thinking too about kind of, well, what is one's complicity in this space? You know, whether or not one knows this history or not. And so the girl series kind of came out of um, kind of trying to navigate all those things. So, so looking at gender, looking at kind of this, um, national history, trying to understand my own relationship to it, but um, always um, one of the reasons that I started using this avatar of girl that you see behind me is that I wanted to make it not my own story. Like it, I thought it was really important that it wasn't seen as um, biographical in any way or autobiographical because what I was responding to was really like this accumulation of things from so many sources, from popular media, from the news, from parent stories, from um, you know, uh, what I learned from communities. And so wanted to create a space that seemed fictional that I could then use that, that kind of storytelling to just for myself to ask these questions. Um, 
and that uh, in this kind of in the span of the work, which um, was between, I think I started this work around 2001 when I was in grad school and it ended up, I worked on it for about 10 years in different iterations. Um, what ended up also creeping in there was um, uh, all the things that were going on in North America. So then you know, 2001, of course it was 9-11 um, and then the kind of the increased militarization um, that was really visible um, in the US. At that time, I moved from Montreal and was living in Baltimore, which is quite close to Washington DC. And so the kind of overt militarism that was evident in the streets um, as well as in the media also kind of came into play. And so I think the, the way I've been working with kind of identity and history through this is kind of my thinking through my own personal story as a almost just a, um, a starting place. Um, you know, and I think Makiko had said earlier something about um, art being um, how we situate ourselves in other stories. And so kind of using that as a starting place to situate a story that hopefully other people would kind of then find themselves in as well. And then through that, um, keeping it open enough that multiple viewpoints could come into it, that if somebody asked, I could talk about what the specifics were, but that it would never have to be about the specifics and could kind of um, reverberate into other situations or contexts. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, and thank you so much for making sense of my very nebulous question, which um, I'm now going to ask Jenna um, if uh, you could uh, answer a similar question I asked you, Diane. So, um, in your in your respective practice, um, could you talk a little bit about you know the role of identity in your work? Hi. Um, yes, uh, I think it's um, identity has been something that I've been really interested in or aware of. Um, as a, as a young age, I, I think back to um, growing up in a small town in Merritt and going to elementary school and having only one other half Asian uh, family uh, attending school. And, and, and well, I wasn't really thinking about identity at the time. I do have like these, these memories that sort of stay with me when, when kids thought it was odd that I brought seaweed to school or um, uh, just thinking about uh, having an awareness of, of, of these moments of memories in my life that um, had, had brought awareness that, uh, you know, having a, la a, a last name, I'm uh, Sasaki is Japanese, but not really feeling connected to that last name and, and uh, having moments that would be brought into uh, you know, through visiting my grandma and, um, you know, having these wonderful meals that I remember and Japanese food that I remember, uh, or, you know, cutting wood to start the fire to have uh, these wonderful baths and these big tubs and, and that those experiences uh, were really different for me. Um, and, and, and started forming this, this curiosity, I guess. And, and so as I, as I got older and, 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 and started thinking about this through my art practice, uh, I, I wanted to, to know more about, uh, about my history and, and, and know more about my roots. Um, but there wasn't really a lot of information. Um, my family, you know, as Craig sort of mentioned earlier, no one really talked about our history or our past. Everyone was very much living in the present. And so I think that's where my art making started was uh, uh, really diving into a curiosity of, of what my family went through. We, and there wasn't a lot of information uh, through education. We weren't learning about internment and, and I wasn't really even aware of internment uh, when I was younger and, and, and probably just in my early adulthood where I really started discovering it. So um, when you look at the exhibit that's currently in the cube at the Camelot's Art Gallery, I think it's, it's really interesting because it, um, it spans about 25 years of, of different art pieces. And so you can see the very early work where I started exploring what, what was the internment, what happened, where you know, my family actually experienced this. And, and there weren't really a lot of people around that could tell me any information about it. So uh, I started really getting into um, 
that interest of, of looking into what, what internment was and, and, and exploring and trying to seek out information on that. And, and then it, it sort of went through a shift. I, I really felt sort of disconnected from, from that art. I, I, was, I was creating this, but I was disconnected to the stories that were being told. I, I felt they weren't my stories. I didn't experience it. And who am I to kind of retell these things? And, and, and I, I kind of ended up going through a bit of a shift and thinking, um, you know, well, well, how did this impact me? And, and uh, you know, becoming aware that there were, there were reasons that, uh, you know, intergenerationally there was, there was an impact, even though I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, because families were interned and, and homes were displaced, there was a, a real active move of that generation to assimilate to be Canadians and, and to sort of, you know, there was a loss of language and there was a, a loss of uh, customs at a very accelerated pace. So uh, while I was sort of exposed to certain cultures on the peripheral, I wasn't ever really immersed in them. And, and I heard my grandparents speaking Japanese, but I was never taught Japanese. And, and so that's when I think I sort of uh, kind of stumbled upon uh, being a hapa and uh, being a, a half Asian with mixed roots and 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 what did that mean and really kind of diving into the um, the community that was also exploring that at the same time and 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 it was still pretty limited information out there and even though you know we live in a very multicultural society there was a lot of questions that were still happening at that time and. And so my work really turned to this kind of this blend of living in between two cultures and and what it was like to be in in the hyphen space hyphen space of being Japanese Canadian um, that kind of bridging two worlds of one that I really didn't understand but was influencing me on some level inherently so uh, and then you know um, kind of more contemporary into the things that are working now it's it's interesting that I've, I've, I've circled back being uh, you know working in the downtown east side and, and Japantown and being around those buildings and and uh, that community and and the disposition the, the displacements and the things that are happening kind of really brought the conversation back uh, not just for me and, and my reflections or my immediate family in that conversations but kind of more into the global identities again. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Craig, did you did you have a did you want to interject? I wasn't sure if you were turning on your video and audio because you no, had something to add. <laughs> I'm just going to be probably not the first one to say, but um, webinar panel discussions are very clunky. <laughs> so um, we're going to we're going to be kind to ourselves about this and we're going to move forward um, and we're going to try our best to to, you know, enjoy this conversation as is through the medium that we have right now. But um, thank you so much, Jenna, for um, expanding further. Um, on the question of identity in your practice, um, thank you everyone so far for kind of working through, you know, the nebulous topic that is identity. And I wanted to start there before we kind of get a little bit more specific, um, because the question of identity, is, as we've all encountered, is, is a very, it's a tricky one. Um, but I, I'd like to go on to um, bring up something, uh, a word that's come up frequently um, in sort of your expanding on um, on your curatorial practices or your artistic practices, um, which is the topic of history. Um, so for in my engagement with Jana and Deanne's work, um, you know, both of your work engage history kind of head on in a way that I'm 
I'm very fond of, I, I really enjoy um, for in the case of Jana's work, um, you know, you have these archival uh, inkjet prints um, that have these archival images of uh, these very real places, both in Kamloops and in the larger area of the BC um, interior. And you have these, um, these uh, uh, expressions, these recollections kind of almost right in the center of, of these images. And it doesn't start with the, you know, in 1994, so-and-so moved, this so-and-so family moved into this area and then this happened. And, and, you know, and it's the same thing with Diane's work. There's these incredibly colorful images of these very real historical, you know, moments but um, you're also not walking into this very specific, very chronological um, uh, indexing of, of what happened, you know, in, in 19 so-and-so, um, this happened and people moved here and there. And so what I'm trying to get at here is that both of your works, um, I think, really do a good job at filling in the gaps that historiographic um, methods, very traditional historiographic methods, ones that depend on, you know, these sort of kind of indexing chronological years, um, they really fill in that gap that um, experience, you know, isn't often found in that kind of method of history. Um, and a lot of just perspectives gets lost there. And it has a way of becoming this kind of official way of understanding this time period. And so we talk about, you know, internment, or we talk about you know, these different attempts, these militaristic attempts of nationalism as though they happen kind of in the past and they stay there. And it's officially depicted in this very specific way, um, whereas both of your work deal with it in a much more complex, much more nuanced way. So um, I wonder if, um, or actually before I ask, I'd like to also offer this perspective that I'm, I'm kind of bringing into it. Um, I'm thinking a lot of uh, Saidiya Hartman's uh, method of, of critical fabulation, um, which to summarize is basically a method whereby fiction and creative work is met with rigorous archival and historical research in order to address the gaps in understanding of, of, of marginalized people. In her particular case, it is the marginalized experience of Black Americans in the Black diaspora. Um, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what your work um, does in terms of what it thinks about history. What is what is your general understanding of history? Um, do you find that, you know, the way that we do history kind of in the official sense, capital H, you know, in the way that it likes to be as objective as possible, um, do you find that, uh, that there are gaps, in fact, that um, your work perhaps, you know, I, I think really centers and, and feels the need to address? I wonder if, um, uh, perhaps Deanne, if you'd like to start, um, if you can maybe perhaps make sense of <laughs> where I'm trying to get at here. Sure, thanks, Marilla. Um, yeah, the history is uh, something that I'm very much interested in, and I think it comes from, um, you know, growing up, my mother used to read me a lot of stories, and a lot of the stories that she would read were kind of these old fables, and part of what she would also uh, talk to me about was kind of, you know, what were which of these stories had some sort of relationship to actual places or actual, um, actual conditions or actual uh, historical events. And so I think from an early age, I always saw history as a form of storytelling. And I always saw the role of kind of the storyteller in understanding that place. Um, and so, um, so I love the stories that are kind of captured through history, even when those stories are sometimes quite hor horrific. Um, and I look to history to try and understand why we're here today in where we are and to try and kind of draw these connections to um, what are the things that exist now that have existed in the past that we still haven't resolved yet? And how do I um, use kind of pictures, forms, materials to, to just start to um, um, draw a little attention to it, to try and make these connections um, and um, to hopefully um, provoke people to ask some questions. Um, and so I think, like, I think in all of my bodies of work, um, certainly in the last like 15, 20 years, um, uh, 
and the girl work and beyond, I often start with reading something that is uh, about something that's happened, you know, either in recent history or, or um, kind of more ancient history, and then start to think about, well, how is this still visible today? What did, what impact um, is here now? Um, but I, I always make a conscious choice to not have the the visual element remain in that place because I don't want people to think that it's it's no longer relevant. And so I try to always combine it with something that's happening in the present day. And a lot of times um, for me, I'm kind of one of those people, like I, I look at a lot of things and I kind of like gather a lot of things. I, I don't, I'm not an organized researcher in any way, shape or form. It's just kind of like piles of, of stuff and information. And then um, sometimes a sentence will come out that'll really strike me. And it might be from a news report. It might be from TV or you know, someone, something I saw on the internet or something. And then that becomes like a way to think about the past and the present. So as an example, in one of the works in the show that um, we expected hysteria, and I was talking about this to Makiko a little while ago, there's these women walking around or the girls are walking around with masks. And that was, I had literally that day um, seen an article about swine flu and how people were starting to wear masks. And so that became kind of one pictorial element in kind of thinking about the relationship of um, kind of human impact on the environment and militarism and all those things. And that was kind of became one visual element. And so in kind of on the surface, they didn't necessarily have anything to do with each other, but then as you kind of draw out a visual story through kind of the pictures and the materials, hoping that people will start to kind of think, well, what does that have to do with, with each other? You know, what haven't we reckoned with and how will this show up again um, unless we do something about it? So it's always this kind of back and forth between past and present, um, asking questions and then trying to draw connections even if they're quite tenuous. Um, and I think the storytelling part is so important in kind of creating a space to where it's not just a, um, looking at things in a way that seems like nothing, no change is possible, but to kind of hopefully through making the work also suggest that something else could happen, something else could be different in, in our kind of reimagining of this. Yeah, absolutely, Nikika. Can I add? I mean, I'm so great. I'm glad that we finally talk with Diane and because <laughs> we we're supposed to talk more earlier. But anyway, that's the I just wanted to add, I mean, I'm really appreciated that Diane's uh, brought up the, the original, like earlier when she started making this, uh, the Gao series. And the reasons I wanted to tell, that's the reasons I wanted to have her works as a kind of entrance to the food story. And I was particularly attracted for this, uh, uh, the Gao series is uh, responding to that, the present situations of COVID-19. And over the time, I see um, a lot of news and some are related to my friends that's uh, in like, for example, like in Myanmar, I just, I told to Diane in earlier in the spring that the friend of mine artist was uh, in the front line of the protest in Myanmar. And then that's, and then I was really worried about the things and then being keep in touch. And then he got into the prisons, he disappeared. And then he has a kid. And so all those things, and over the, the period of times uh, during the pandemic, I see a lot of um, uh, the very um, uh, tragic situations happening everywhere in the world. And at and the same time that we, um, we think, I think of how, and, and related to the idea of the history, how those uh, children uh, embody of the uh, current experience of pandemic and then those uh, oppression or, you know, that I've been keep thinking. And then I realized that Diane's work was a part of the collection of Kamloops Art Gallery and I look at again and then start thinking of that her uh, your construction of narrative is more for me it was a more relevant to today to to look at how those um, history that you ex you had a lived experience but it's you created as more kind of fictional narratives that it's and then 
specifically about environmental issues or that's oppressions or nationalism, which also related to my own cultures that in Japan, it's become more nationalistic and more so during the Olympic, you know, all those things being uh, become more crucial. And then I saw that um, the further adventure of girls, I wanted to bring it back and see it again from today's perspective and, and specifically thinking about how the children matters on that particular period. So I'm really appreciated that DM brought that how that you um, created your artworks as a, in a kind of storytelling, but in a kind of more complex way and then fictional and then mix as more kind of uh, bloaters. Uh, structures of that. Thank you, Makiko. Yeah, um, I I should I should specify too that the the title of Diane's work, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, the Further Adventures of Girl series. Um, for the attendees who have not had a chance to see this exhibition, um, as well as uh, Jenna Sasaki's work, um, the, uh, the archival inkjet prints, they all have different names. They're all titled differently. And uh, the ones that are featured in the museum, at least, um, there's one titled Campbell Creek Hop Farm. Uh, uh, there's one on uh, Slim Shoyama Bakery slash Office of Surrealist Investigation. Um, and they have all these titles. And what I distinctly appreciate about both Deanne and Jenna's work is that there is very clearly a perspective. There isn't some, you know, this isn't coming from uh, this idea that it's just this, you know, kind of objectivity um, as though there isn't a, a present uh, individual there that is sharing their their perspective of this of the story. We have for the further adventures of girl where we're introduced to this avatar by the name of girl. Um, and it's very clear there that there is this perspective. And then in that perspective, we understand the importance of why this particular historical moment and why these particular perspectives are, are important. Um, and it's the same thing with Jana's work. Um, we have these, these sharings of these stories, these recollections, the, the relationship of the individuals that are sharing um, their recollections of say, you know, the, the, the Creek Hop Farms. Um, uh, you're, you're, in, you're introduced to this dialogue from a very particular perspective. Um, and for anyone who is in, and ever intimately works with history as a discipline, sort of capital H history, um, is that it often tries to poise itself in opposition of subjectivity. It often tries to poise itself as something that is away from the experiential and the memory. Um, as something to be um, thought of as just this very isolated fact. Um, and that doesn't leave room for, you know, as I say, perspective. And I think uh, both, you know, Deanne and Jenna, your work really um, engages these historical moments with a very clear perspective. Um, Jenna, I wonder if I can pass a question along to you um, about you know, the role of, of history in your work. I, I know you've expanded on it already in, in the question of identity, and it's often very difficult to separate the two, identity and history in that way. Um, and perhaps that's the point. Um, but I wonder if you can um, expand similarly to the question that I asked at the end, um, what your work's disposition is towards history. Um, if, if, you know, if, if that question makes sense, uh, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the research into history sort of helps unpack things for me a little bit, but I'm also, you know, very interested in the storytelling of things and 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 interesting interested in the history of place and I think that that's um, uh, shown shown in the museum works as well as some of the Powell Street works and um, kind of looking at at the fluidity of change and and um, I like kind of letting some of the historical things kind of creep in and and uh, you know always looking through 
old photographs or newspaper articles and 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 those sort of give the viewer a glimpse of information or or what the dialogue was like or what the text or context was like during during some period um but also sort of contrasting that with the present and and you know what do these buildings look like now how have they shifted how have the perceptions changed uh, but then tying tying something personal and 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 in some ways that I don't think it matters if it's my voice or a, uh, or someone else's story. I, I like that sometimes it's ambiguous, uh, where I mean, it, it leaves it openness for conversation, where 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 um, you can connect to certain things uh, through the the work, whether it be past or the present or how it shifted or you know like it, looking at. Um, Slim's Bakery, for example, there there are two stories in that one piece, mm -hmm. and uh, and and the place has changed and shifted, and and both of those stories and both of those connections and and how those stories have come together uh, uh, through through an interest in history and and Japanese Canadians and 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 things is also very interesting to me, and so um, I I think. History is such a uh, a broad thing, and and there it, it's open. It, the the stories are open to so many different interpretations or connections. But I do like how there's oral histories that sort of, uh, you know, the the the, the text kind of balances out, or or I, I like having kind of the two different viewpoints or 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 something, and that that definitely connects through the history. Um, no, I don't know. I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> no, certainly. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify real quick, Craig, the, um, the Office of Surrealist Investigation, that particular print, that, that is your recollection of what that built of, you know, what was the Office of Surrealist Investigation, formerly the uh, Slim Shoyama Bakery, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I'll uh, just quickly on that one, you know, trying, uh, we, I guess we kind of put a call out through the KJCA to get people to, to contribute like that to Jana's work. There, there were multiple calls, but basically it was, there were a few sites that, that, that were kind of historically significant that, uh, had been put forward a few years ago as Japanese Canadian historical sites uh, of importance, whatever. I think there were, I, I can't remember the number total, but it was four BC and five were nominated in Kamloops. Uh, so I tried to get people to, to share about these things either with me and as part of the exhibition or their experience or work, let's work with Jana uh, and share this thing and we can uh, reveal all these things, the, the multiple stories in there. Um, uh, Jana refers to two stories. One is me as a kid recollecting going to Slim's Bakery and it's this Japanese guy and, and just this little experience there. And then the other one is just a handful of years ago I leased that space as an artist studio. And uh, I knew the space as the old bakery. It had been a catering place. I think it was like the cattle drive offices for a short term. And then it was, I think, vacant for 10 years. So to kind of jump back in there. And then uh, it was on an artist grant. So I, I negotiated with the landlords. Then to walk in there and see Slim's baker uh, oven is still in there. It was still in the back. It was this big, disconnected, big gas oven. So uh, I guess I did start looking into that a little bit. So looking up Slim Shoyama at the KMA, trying to find some images, trying to find some information on him. So I had a little kind of display in my studio with a map pinpointing these locations. So it did in that sense, it made me think about a, more locations and the history of, of what was there, what's there now. 
and kind of what has come out of that. So there are all these little things like uh, Slim was a big LA Dodger fan or something, or he helped out with this uh, organization or uh, so a lot of those things I had kind of tacked to my wall. And then in coming into this exhibition, uh, Matt McIntosh was very uh, open in saying that the KMA uh, archive didn't have a lot of Japanese Canadian history or, or, or items or anything. Um, and he actually, he had invited me a lot to scrutinize that quite a bit and which uh, doesn't come through, I think, directly in the in the show, but there were funny things like you. There was a file in the KMA called Japanese, and inside it was like a, a newspaper article about Sakaki Motors, one of these significant sites. I think the opening of the Kamloops Japanese Canadian Association, another one of these sites, a reference to the hop farms. Oh, a Japanese woman who had won the Rodeo Queen title in 1950. And a few just oddities just kind of spread around, not much looking at internment, not much at looking at, uh, I guess, settlement here, I suppose. If you dug far enough, yeah, you look up 1135 Victoria Street and Slim Shoyama, and Tom Shoyama started the New Canadian and all these things. So to really get that history. And I found similar things that I spoke of with KJCA. You'd be, there'd be, the census says there are eight families in Canada pre-World War II, Shoyama, and then they don't know the others or the location of certain things, the, the hop farms and the Oishi farm. People that I talked to and even the photos in the archive uh, one of the contributors swears that the photo isn't the hop farm. And then Matt looks at all of this material in the KMA archive and said, and like so many claims from one piece of misinformation or have been extrapolated to, if this photo is the hop farm, then this photo must be Campbell Creek and this photo must be this location. And then this history is tied to that. Oh, and then, it, so it's really a jumble. And like you talk about, like having this kind of capital H history isn't always accurate. And I think in particular, since Matt coming to the KMA, that has really shifted in the outlook of the museum. And it was good to see, and it was encouraging to see that kind of like he'd been we had been talking about some kind of collaboration for years. So to, to kind of sort through some of that history and then to have that, that's the same experience I had with most of the Japanese community is this kind of fuzzy uh, recollection of place, of memory, and to kind of piece that all together. So I think a lot of those things came through and, and then a lot of those things lead to like, huh, well, if this is something, what about this? And I kind of hope that's what the exhibition does is to hopefully reveal a history people in Camelos in particular may not have known and the bigger, broader history that maybe we don't hear as much about and then to see what those places are like now and then hopefully spark, spark a discussion to get into that further. We have a little contribution wall for people to share further recollections. So hopefully, a lot of those historical uh, well, memories for one, reflections, but also uh, things we thought that were, can, or can, can people can question a lot of that stuff. And, and maybe hopefully, uh, I think we keep coming back to this, is, is opening up that perspective. And another way, um, I think it's not just the perspective, but you could go read a history book or you could watch a YouTube video or you could read uh, comics or whatever whatever your historical source is. The, the art and the perspective of art or seeing this in another mode is just another kind of access point that hopefully gets you uh, interested to dig a little deeper or visually see it a little differently.
Yeah, I, <laughs> um, no, I, I, I often point to, so in the last couple of tours that I conducted, I often point to that specific piece um, as a, a kind of a, a linchpin into talking about, you know, the reality of, of what, you know, what we call history is a series of events, which is not anything that happens in a kind of linearity, but so, for example, the intention of the bakery, you know, that it became, you know, for a little bit, the office of surrealist investigation, that doesn't fit into, you know, the general practice of history, which often sees things, you know, especially the stories and the histories and experiences of marginalized peoples as being something is very linear. Um, it doesn't, it, it, the reality is it doesn't uh, actually condone to that kind of fixity, um, which is something that um, you know, Professor Kirsten Emiko McAllister, who's a professor at SFU, when talking about internment, um, stresses as you know something being very important, a, a very important consideration when talking about general Japanese Canadian experience or any kind of identity experience, especially in the face of, you know, uh, horrific nationally sanctioned uh, forms of violence is that there is a temptation to talk about it in a very linear way. Um, but we often have to push against that because these experiences and these stories the events that happened before, during, and after, they're very heterogeneous. There is nothing homogenous about it. It's not a monolith. Um, and I, I really enjoy uh, the work of, you know, Diane's work for um, the series of Girl. Um, it, it just, it comes to mind for me, that idea of critical fabulation. Um, it's not necessarily that there is anything uh, that the idea of using creativity or fiction means that anything is fake, but so much as that it's, there is a perspective there. Um, and the way that both you and uh, Jenna work with, you know, print, these kinds of print media, uh, often my mind, when I think about history, I often think about history textbooks and stuff. Um, and I just think that this, the use of media, of, of print media, I think, puts into question our, 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 our common conceptions of how we're supposed to talk his, about history, about how we're supposed to talk about, you know, historical events. Um, so I, I'd like to, to move on. Um, I have a couple questions for you, Makiko and Craig, um, from your perspective as, as curators. Um, so when we're talking about history, we're talking about identity, we're very clearly pointing to something that is um, not anything that you can kind of wrap up in a singular package. Makiko, as you said about, you know, the way we talk about stories, um, it's not, you know, beginning, middle, end but it's always in situ. It's always, you know, there's no answer. There's perhaps more questions, but they're certainly there. Um, so I'm interested in learning a little bit about, you know, what is it like to take these concepts of history and identity and place them in a situation of exhibition, you know, where, where the practice of exhibition comes in, um, are there any challenges when it comes to talking about these subject matters in the form of exhibition, especially when you're thinking about like the institution of art museums, the institution of museums, um, oftentimes people expect, I find, um, very straightforward answers, you know, about if you're talking about in the case of the museum, Japanese Canadian identity, tell me about what it means to be Japanese Canadian identity in this very straightforward way. Um, but we know that that's not possible. So where does that, how do you work with that particular challenge, especially when it comes to the expectations of, of, of what exhibitions are supposed to do? Um, Makiko, I wonder if maybe you can uh, guide us into that contemplation a bit. Oh my God, that's uh, <laughs> another huge question. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't think we have a lot of time and then there's a bunch of great questions. So mm -hmm. I don't wanna, uh, I want to have open up other people's, but I believe that contemporary art has a very uh, challenging in the very rules of institution and the very way of that kind of structure. So, you know, like it's a great example of Diane's work. That's, it's not the way to 
inform about the history, but it's open up this, you know, that's very complex questions. And I think it's the, the Kamloops Art Gallery being very critically uh, curated uh, programs. And I'm so grateful that I've been invited to do this and specifically in this COVID time, the, the, the COVID pandemic time, that it's really, we all kind of confused about, you know, where we are at in the situation. And then it's like, that's, um, it's very limited that we can't gather together or discuss, but this kind of programs or the way to like, to think and further about that, what's the gallery functions and what art function and how we can support that. It's, you know, it's a kind of ongoing open up questions. And I hope that's the, my exhibitions because that we really, I really wanted to focus on the artist's voice and the, the complexity of the artist representing the issues that's not necessary in religions, in all like kind of, you know, the academic research sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think actually, you know, with, with such big questions and so little time, we'll probably just transition over to, uh, to Q&A because there are a lot of wonderful questions and I'd, I'd like to pass on uh, the opportunity to ask them to, uh, to wonderful attendees. So um, I'll, uh, I'll pass the baton over to Emily um, to, to facilitate the Q&As. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. This has been an incredible conversation. Um, we need to do another three of these so that we can <laughs> flesh out some of these ideas a bit more. Uh, so we have four questions, um, two that were submitted in our, through our Q&A here and two that were submitted uh, through registrations. Um, so I'm just going to bounce back and forth between them. I'm going to start with one from Brian Hiyashi. Uh, thank you for mentioning me, Craig, and hello, everyone. I totally encourage everyone to continue your efforts. My friends have all been interested in the KMA show. The only comment I have heard is they wish there had been more included because even they know, knew a lot of Japanese Canadians that weren't mentioned. I tried to explain that the first few generations of Japanese Canadians are very different from the recent ones who are interested in their heritage and roots and are used to having deep and relevant discussions. My parents, Nisei, and grandparents, Issei, were far from reticent and quiet about telling stories and revealing things. I also didn't realize that it would be difficult for Craig to get people to open up about the 50s and 60s, but I do understand. Hence, a lot of stories are still untold. But the remaining residents, non-Japanese, of the area have a lot of memories also. Perhaps they can tell their stories. <laughs> yeah, that was our biggest challenge to get people to, to share. Uh, um, I'll try to be brief. It, it was about the fall of 2019, I believe, where real work started on this exhibition. And we, I, I went to, uh, you have to excuse if I don't remember, Kirokai, like the, the seniors appreciation event at the KGACA. And I spoke and said, oh, we're going to do this exhibition. And I'd love to talk to all of you. And, uh, and then things kind of will slow down in the winter time. But then in the spring, we'll open up and we'll have all these social things and all these things happen at the KJCA. It's a real hub of the cultural community. And then the pandemic came. So the key to getting all this information, I was told time and time again by like the board and, and members of the KJCA was, get all these older folk together in a group and get them chatting, have some tea, have some snacks and they'll spill everything. And they'll be, and, uh, and unfortunately that never really could happen. And, and then, uh, but I, I got little bits of things here and there and I tried to spread the word as much as I can and have people spread the word. So it, it was hard for people to share, I fully, understand that and then certain things that I really wanted to kind of get into I 
I pushed and I tried to get friends of people to push their friends to really, this is important. You got to talk about this. You got to, you have something for us. And there's a lot of reticence, but I think it was the two weeks of install. Suddenly people are like, can I put this? Can I give you this? So it was great to finally see that. I have excellent contribution after that. Brian is one of the most forthcoming people uh, we dealt with. And uh, I think kind of as we got close to opening, more and more people were like, ah, okay, here's a model of the uh, North Cal's motors. Here's something else. Can you bring this in? And, and I tried to uh, welcome as much of that stuff as I could, but as putting together exhibitions and doing all this stuff, uh, uh, we couldn't, but the important thing is if you go see the show, I, we had this in mind and it's, we have a resource area where you can continue adding contributions. So if you are around here, if you do see the show, if you have memories, write something down and pin it up. I know Makiko did a little one for us. And if you have copies of photos or something, pin them up on the bulletin board, or if you have a comment on something you, you see, or maybe has been overlooked or we just didn't get to, uh, there were the shows on till March, we welcome this conversation. And, and, and as you say, Emily, there will be more programming uh, regarding the KMA exhibition for sure. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next, we have a question from Amy Modell submitted when uh, she registered through Zoom. If not addressed, I wonder if you might speak to how narrative informs or coheres your work. This is an open question for everyone. Sure, I can uh, take a stab at that. And hi, Amy. Um, Thanks for the question. Um, I think just in thinking about forms, I'm, I'm assuming to think about narrative and then forms, it's forms in terms of what the work looks like and the materials. Um, in the girls series, I was definitely thinking through um, histories of printmaking. I think somebody, uh, Mirella, you brought back, brought up the uh, importance of printed matter and the ways that printed matter, um, you know, have a certain kind of look that seem authoritative and a certain kind of uh, lack of um, lack of the hand. And so that's why everything's kind of digitally made and, and there's no kind of sense of anything that's too handmade in any of the works. And um, just wanted to, as much as possible, kind of copy or mimic these types of forms. And so the, the prints are all very slick um, so that that would also kind of contain the narrative to kind of put it in a particular context like a poster or like um, an advertisement or like a, a children's book narrative. Um, the banners were also kind of thinking about kind of the way banners are kind of used in the street to tell um, narratives of nationalism or narratives that are kind of um, civic pride or things that are again about kind of a, 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 an identity larger than oneself. Um, and then the video, um, it's taking the form um, sign off of a TV um, when TV was not 24 hours and there would be the, the kind of uh, video that would be at the end of every air, um, air day that would be often quite nationalistic as well and have like flags and armies and landscape and kind of told a narrative of that particular type of identity. And so for me, the kind of using the, the different forms kind of help to contextualize where this kind of girl fictional space is and how that that space is complicit in kind of thinking through um, national histories or how national histories are um, might be defined through these kind of individuals in it. I wonder if uh, I can offer a quote that comes to mind with that question on on narrative. Um, I my in my work um as emily pointed out in the beginning uh, a lot of my my research is often in relation to um the black and afro diaspora um and when we talk about stories we talk about narrative we talk about history um i the work of chinua chibi comes to mind um in his book hopes and impediments and he has this quote where he says uh people create stories create people or rather stories create people, create stories. And it's 
it, it's one of those quotes where like you can sit down and kind of repeat it over and over again and, and maybe move around the, the intonation and everything and go people create stories. But it's to say that the any attempt to kind of create um, like for that book specifically to create this kind of monolithic identity of an African's people, um, you are inherently going to have gaps. Whereas I think what in Jenna and, and Dion's work and the purpose of both the exhibitions at the KMA and the CAG, what they do is, um, and I've said this already, is they offer a very particular perspective, meaning that there isn't, you know, as Dion said, there isn't this invisible hand claiming to say that there is, you know, this one narrative of how to be when talking about historical events and such. Um, so I, I, I definitely appreciate those, that particular perspective, that particular thesis in both exhibition. Um, and I think, you know, Charo, what, what um, she mentioned in the chat there is that maybe art and exhibition are the best way to get a fluid and confuse, uh, confuse stories through metaphor. Um, and I think that's always our inclination is to go to stories, to go to metaphor, to kind of create a kind of tangibility to, to the historical reality and just reality in general, which is that it's it's messy. It's it's something we have to go back to and rethink about and then sort of switch perspectives, switch a lens. There's always going to be a different iteration of it. Um, so I'm very grateful to both exhibitions for illuminating that. Next, we have a question from Padre Reynolds. It seems that reclaiming identity is a big part of the Indigenous reconciliation process. Did any of the artists find their practice a, recon a reconciliatory, excuse me, reconciliatory process, i.e. understanding and forgiving the wrongs that were done to you, your families, and the wider Japanese community by the state? Or did this make the artists angry, frustrated, etc., with the lack of any real reparations made by Canada? Uh, I can try to answer this question in a side-skirted way, probably. Um, it's, a, it's a huge question. Uh, my, my, my initial um, thoughts immediately go to, to what we hear over and over again is, is um, that, oh, it happened, uh, we accept it, let's move on, you know, let's have this conversation. And, and that's like been deeply rooted in me and, and has come up over and over again in conversations that I've had with people that I've been interviewing is, yes, this is just something that has happened and, and we don't really talk about it. And, and uh, so I, I, I don't think that uh, I've ever been really super frustrated or angered um, I think you asked uh, regarding um, the things that have happened in the past, but I've uh, become more and more aware of the importance of the, the conversation and having exhibitions in these moments, open dialogues for um, awareness and understanding and education that many people don't know or, or understand and having perhaps that uh, first person narrative or story or memory that connects to some of the artworks that I'm doing um, makes it accessible in some way or, 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 or puts a, a just can just, yeah, I guess just opens the dialogue. And I think that's really important. Um, but it is very interesting. And Craig's talked about it in both the, the work that I've done with the, the the museum, as well as my research in the the Powell Street, um, for the most part, except as as Craig mentioned, Brian Brian has been amazing to work with and and was wonderful and told so many stories and and I would love to chat with him more and more and more, but a general theme was of resistance to talk about it and. And there, there, there was always uh, just conversation. Well, this person lived here, and this person lived here, and oh yes, there was that building, and oh, I do remember something. But as 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 conversations happened, and as we uh, got more into things, little little memories or little bits uh, did start to pop out, and and I think that's kind of an interesting 
involvement with the works itself too. And I and I hope as as people sort of look at them and 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 delve into them that they kind of have an involvement of thinking too. Okay, and our final question is from Anushe Malik, submitted through the Zoom registration. What are the possible collaborations that can exist between academic historians, their classrooms, and artists and galleries? Um, um, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You go <laughs> ahead, Marco. Yeah. Okay. I feel like... No, I just realized that Emily, uh, you organize uh, uh, great public programs along mm -hmm. the exhibition. I'm really appreciate it, and that's uh, beside of my talk with an artist that you have a lot of, you know, like the programs and like the tours and things. You're probably a good person to answer this question. Don't you? <laughs> because in particularly these limited conditions that you know that we have to use a lot of online and things, but um, I think you really sought through to build those kind of public programs. You're very kind to me, Mikiko. I want to give space for the other panelists okay. to respond first. Then. <laughs> Well, I just wanted well, to quickly, I just wanted to quickly say that I guess you see a lot of this, uh, like academics and artists work together, perhaps in the research and development of work. Um, I know, I mean, Makiko, you're, you are correct. Uh, we do get some academics from the local, from Thompson Rivers University here in Kamloops to take part in our uh, uh, programs and and we've seen um, work develop uh, right in our uh, TRU about uh, like I think it's Cura was the organization looking at art and culture in small cities um, parts of our creative writing department I can't think of them off the top of my head right now I think to, to address the question, there are lots of opportunities. Uh, I, I don't have all the forms of them, but definitely a, a resource. I think maybe the only thing I'll add is I think, um, you know, it's not just necessarily collaboration, but how each of each of the kind of different entry points towards looking at history or looking at narrative um, also offers a different way of, of um, communicating and disseminating that and you know in each space kind of talks to different groups of people so I think um, uh, that to me is the exciting part is thinking through like what are the different languages that can be used um, to speak about a particular moment and then how do you um, share that with um, different groups of people in different communities and I think that's where some of the collaborations can happen. Yeah, I think, um, you know, from the perspective of somebody who tries to create programs to engage various publics in the exhibitions and, and the artists and their works and, and materials, um, you know, I think where academia could really benefit is, is coming at it with a, with a more open perspective, the way that artists and their artworks tend to, or at least the way that we approach them here, you know, with um, student-led uh, tours where we're asking the students to tell us what are they seeing in the works and um, coming at stories and, and histories from the perspective of uh, open questions and open dialogue and creating conversation and encouraging folks with disparate ideas to talk through those ideas um, using the artworks as as the medium for that conversation I think that is really exciting.
Uh, Brian Hayashi has added in the questions. Reconciliation is a big topic that might be discussed a lot more. As immigrants, Japanese Canadians might have a different perspective to the Native Canadian reconciliation discussions, i.e. Native Canadians versus new Canadians, colonists or immigrants from 500 years ago versus newer immigrants, Japanese Canadians 150 years ago. Wow. These are, yeah, big conversations. Yeah, large um, contemplations. I, I have a small, like I have a, a curator note in the portion of the exhibition and it's, it's something that crossed my mind while putting this together and kind of looking into internment and, 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 the, and the history and, and, and thinking of like, seizure of land and property, dispossession of people, internment, like this is, I have the same question, like how do you reconcile that happening to indigenous people or like we've seen like something like the Chinese head tax or the Komogata Maru incident or uh, like, looking into Islamophobia and these kind of things in more recent times, like the question previous about, uh, are you angry or frustrated about these things that have happened? Are we just getting over them? Like, I'm not angry or frustrated about those things. It has something to do with why perhaps I am here in this location. But when you see those things happen over and over again or happen again to different people or the same mindset continue. That's the angry, uh, frustrating part. So to keep those conversations alive, I guess, and to uh, be, sure, be sure that's brought out, to be sure that uh, continues to be discussed. Like, um, I don't think it's always about answers so much as just like get it in people's face is is more important to me as you can tell a lot of that stuff really overwhelms me but uh, yeah that's i mean but, but i don't I, but the answer isn't really there <laughs> i don't think but it, it, it's something that we work toward or work on or recognize I think uh, the the question on the importance of of reconciliation and re the reclamation of identity. I think what cannot be forgotten in in understanding that uh, is that it's it's also a reclamation of just truth, right? So in truth and reconciliation, we cannot engage reconciliation until we talk about truth. And the truth of the matter is that much of what we're discussing, it's very multi-layered. Um, and at the base of it, we're talking about national, nationally sanctioned forms of violence that happened on already occupied land. Um, and we alone already have, I think, as a larger you know, country, um, a very hard time with just meeting that head on just alone is, is just the very truths that are necessary to engage with, um, that are necessary to actually address what reconciliation looks like. And reconciliation is certainly multi-pronged. Um, so we talk about the importance of identity representation. That's certainly one step, but there are some very structural um, um, uh, resolutions that need to be made. Um, and I see museums and uh, galleries having had their institutional roles um, arguably in making these um, ideas of nationalism, of these ideas of, you know, the, the role of occupation um, kind of at the forefront. I think now the responsibility of museums and galleries is to reduce the harm of that reality and to make the space for engaging with those truths. Um, and I think the exhibition of whose stories, the exhibition of collective memories, um, identity and injustice is a, a way of getting to that. 
Um, so there's going to be more questions, of course, on how do we actually get to reconciliation. Um, I think we're at the stage of getting to the truth first. Um, that, that would be my, my inclination to addressing that question. Thank you all so much for all of this. I recognize we're, we're rolling up to eight o'clock now, so I unfortunately have to <laughs> bring us to a close now, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, this has been incredible. I so appreciate all of you uh, sharing with us tonight, um, for all of you joining us here tonight. Uh, this has been recorded and uh, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and the website uh, in the coming days maybe a week. Um, and so I encourage you to share it with folks you know so that they can hear this as well. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to the Kamloops Art Gallery e-news, please do that so that you can be informed about all the great things that we're doing and the same for the museum. Thank you all. Thank you to everybody. A hand to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.